Hi all, thank you for letting me, listening to me, letting me come and speak today. I guess um, my story is typical of a mother um, who's had a difficult pregnancy. You can see it, it says here, don't worry too much, babies born at 34 weeks usually do fine. But my 34 weeker was 1.4 kilos. <laughs> It's funny, I still get teary thinking about it now. He had a heart condition and he was being fed by a tube. What does this mean? So I was an older first time mother, got pregnant very easily. I'm 41, I got pregnant that quickly. That's not what it says in the media. Baby was due when I was 42. I had horrendous all day morning sickness. Um, it didn't stop at nine weeks, it didn't stop at 12 weeks. It went on till about 16 weeks. I was on Maxilon, which helped quite a bit. I had a job to get to, um, and I didn't want to spend all day throwing up in the loos. I had a CVS at 12 weeks. Because of my age, I wanted to check that all was good. Um, and baby was a boy growing normally, all was fine at that point. At 20 weeks scan, baby was growth restricted. What did this mean? I wasn't quite sure and I don't think I fully understood um, until after he was born what exactly that meant. 22 weeks scan, there was a heart condition. This was later confirmed by the cardiologist, one medium moderately sized VSD with an associated heart murmur um, and some bladder and other urinary abnormalities were present. I went home and went to bed for two days. I didn't know what any of this meant. I googled. Google didn't, wasn't able to enlighten me either. It was a pretty horrendous time to be honest. Um, so I had regular um, ultrasounds then until about 30 weeks. Baby was extremely small but kept growing slowly and kept, so we monitored and we progressed and we moved on and I just tried to deal with it I guess as best that I could. So at 33 weeks, you're all experts, you probably know what was coming. At 33 weeks, I was struggling, I was miserable, I was swollen, I was trying to get to my job every day. I had a constant stabbing pain under my breast. I thought maybe this is just part of pregnancy, you know, being uncomfortable and miserable. I'd been feeling sick and throwing up a bit. I had nosebleeds constantly, which was, I found very difficult. And yes, I had preeclampsia. I visited my obstetrician, the wonderful Dr. Leah Zhu. Um, and I suddenly, she took my blood pressure and sort of, you know, was a bit stunned. It was 180 over 120. Normally I have quite low blood pressure, I've, you know. So of course I was admitted to my hospital, Francis Perry House, where I was confirmed as having preeclampsia. I had all three of the indicators, um, the protein in the urine and swollen, um, yeah, everything. Um, so I was in hospital for the next week with blood pressure meds and steroid shots to strengthen baby's lungs. And the baby was monitored and really wasn't moving enough. So he was delivered. At 34 weeks, weighing 1.4 kilos. I remember he squeaked like a tiny mouse when he was delivered. But he was able to breathe unassisted. There was no NICU for us, so we had a five-week stay at Francis Perry House where he was the smallest baby there and on the highest level of care. His weight actually dropped back to 1.1 kilos in the days after birth, which was a bit scary. But then it sort of seemed to settle and he started to gain weight. And eventually, after... Five weeks, he was discharged at 1.9 kilos. One of the smallest babies they'd ever sent home, they said to us at the time. So some of my thoughts on the indicators from my experiences. Thinking about your care during labour and birth, were you involved as much as you wanted to be? So yes, I felt involved. I felt very grateful for the care and consideration I received. But I had some decisions to make and I didn't always know what decisions I should make or what decisions I wanted to make. I think as mothers, we often struggle to know how to respond, to work out what option we should choose, what is the best option for our baby, what is best for us. 
I suspect this is the case for many of us. We are given all the information from all of our wonderful professionals who do not want to make our decisions for us, but we often struggle to make those decisions ourselves. I think, you know, I consider myself, you know, well-educated and fairly informed, but I was absolutely baffled by some of the information being given to me and didn't really know what I should be choosing, what my options, what was the best option. You know, I found it all very, very difficult to deal with the amount of information that I had through all of the problems that we had. I think, um, whereas I know you all don't want to make our decisions for us, sometimes, from my experience, I wished that I'd had more guidance and I even wished that someone would have said to me, this is the best option for you. This is probably what you should do. Did I feel that midwives and other health professionals gave me consistent advice? about feeding. Well, it was a tricky one for feeding because my milk never really came in. I was sick, I was on medication, I had legs the size of massive tree trunks because I had really bad edema after delivery. I couldn't even walk or get around the hospital. Baby was being fed by tube um, and really was too, too tiny and too small to suck and he wasn't able to actually even get sorted with a dummy or latch on or anything for another three weeks. Meanwhile, he was doing well on the formula that was being fed via the tube. So it was very tricky to sort of deal with trying to produce milk and all that in that circumstances. And I must say, I got a little cross with some of the advice I received. Don't worry about it, you've got enough to do. No, you need to keep trying, come on, let's have another go. You know, it sort of was, depending on what nurse was on duty, I must say advice varied quite a bit. And I kind of felt, you know what, I've got a lot of things to worry about here. I've got a baby with a heart condition. I've got surgery coming. I've got this, I've got that. Milk was almost the last thing on my mind, to be honest. So we struggled with feeding and we never really quite got there, I have to say. Other thoughts? This is the part of the, um, in the introduction by Professor Hunt about um, the rest reduction in um, babies with growth restriction after 40 weeks. There's still, though, very little information available on growth restriction and its impacts. It's never mentioned in pregnancy books, news sites, other stories, other information sources. I found it very hard to get information on what the impacts would be for a very small baby. And going back to the first screen, you know, he'll be fine. He was 34 weeks, but he was so tiny. There were 28-week babies that were bigger than him, you know. When the obstetrician said he's very small, they kept saying that through all the ultrasounds. Well, look, he's very small. I really didn't know what this meant. And I actually, like I said, I actually wondered if they meant he's going to be short. I had no clue what he's very small meant, and there was very little information available at the time. Just a thought. And just, uh, just from my perspective, it's still, a, a, I think, you know, when we manage babies and when we deal with premature babies ongoing, we, um, we go by how, you know, this was a 34-weeker, so he should be this, this is a 32-weeker, he's probably got this problem. But we don't really make adjustments for babies that were very, very tiny and undersized. So what happened next? Oh, this is just, yes, there was a, this is just what happened afterwards. Scans found that Charles's VSD had improved to become two small VSDs, which meant hopefully they would heal without surgery, which they did over time, and he now has no heart issues. His urinary issues would require um, extensive surgery, so we had three major operations with the last one when he was 18 months old. And in common with many PREMs and growth-restricted babies, Charles was a little slow to meet some of his milestones, remained underweight for some years, but is now a healthy, still very lean and small, slightly small eight-year-old. He deal, he's dealing with ADHD and a couple of other issues, but he's highly intelligent and doing well. And as I've noted there, shout out to Dr. Lance Fung, his cardiologist, and Mr. Alan Woodward, his surgeon. The impact that you medical professionals and the surgeons and that have on families like Charles and like mine, I don't think you can underestimate the impact that you have. 
We um, have probably been long forgotten by Dr. Fung and Mr. Woodward, but we will remember forever. I have never forgotten some of the things that happened with our medical professionals and the impact that they've had on our lives has been huge. So please don't underestimate the impact that you will have. And there's Charles. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you. Thanks, Liz. Um, that was brilliant. I'm not going to let Liz sit down just yet. We have got five or ten minutes. So does anyone have any questions for Liz? There's time at the end of the session for um, some panel discussion about this set of talks. But if anyone has anything for Liz before she sits down. Yes. Oh, can you just wait for the microphone? It's right behind you. Hi, Liz. That was really lovely. Thank you for sharing. One of the things that struck me as a midwife was the inconsistency in the communication and the information around your feeding. Mm. One of the questions that I have for you and one of the things that I picked up out of that is that it, um, it seemed to be no, there was no connection to your actual experience or wishes. Mm. Would you have any suggestions for us as a professional group around how do we deal with that? You know, I've been a midwife for 30 years and this has consistently come up over the time. And I what, think... What would you think? How well, I we think... I don't, I don't feel that my, I knew my own wishes necessarily. And that gets back to what I was saying earlier. I don't think that... I just was completely unsure what to do. I was sick, my hormones were going mad, so I was bursting into tears every five minutes in the week or so after birth, as you can imagine. Um, and I kind of was just looking for somebody to tell me what should happen. And everybody said, your milk will come in after two or three days. It didn't. And I really didn't know what to do. And, I, and, and, and like I said, I do think there was some inconsistency because... To, at the, my hospital at that time... There were two kinds of nurses. There seemed to be the younger agency nurses who were much more, it's cool, you'll be all right, you do what you need to do. And there were some older nurses at the hospital who I think were a little more rigid. And perhaps, and perhaps it's something that's just changing with time, you know. Um, some of the older nurses would come in and poke me and grab me and say, let's make this milk come out, you know. And then other nurses would say, don't worry about it, you have a rest. <laughs> so, you know, that, that's all I can say on that, really. <laughs> Rose, hang on a second, Liz, you're not quite off the hook. <laughs> She's determined to sit down, though. <coughs> Rose Boland. Hi, Lisa, thank you. Um, I'm laughing because I know exactly the person you're talking about at Francis Perry. Can I ask you, do you think as um, a mum-to-be during those weeks of your pregnancy, when you'd found out from 20 weeks about that you had a baby who did have fetal growth restriction, would it have been helpful in hindsight or unhelpful to you as a parent to have had written information yes. about potentially what that might mean? Absolutely. Knowing that potentially it might not be an actualisation? Absolutely. It would have been. There wasn't anything much. And that may have changed because this was, you know, eight years ago, but there really wasn't... I couldn't find anything other than IUGR. It means that babies are much smaller than they should be at this stage of development. That was it. What did that mean? No idea. <laughs> no one was able to sort of say, you know. So, yes, it would have been. And I think, I don't know how common it is now for that to happen. I don't know whether I was extremely rare or whether it's becoming more common. But if someone had given me a brochure or a flyer or something, yes, definitely. <laughs> Thank you. Hi. Did you have access to um, breastfeeding antenatal classes and did you have access to a lactation consultant? We sort of let that go by that point, to be honest, because by then, baby was doing well on his... He had some, some special formula in the first couple of weeks, then he went to normal formula and he was doing really well. He was rapidly putting on weight. And we kind of... I think by the time I got out of hospital, which was five days later, I really probably just had other things to worry about, to be honest. I think if I'd pushed for it, maybe I would have been offered that, but... What about in your pregnancy, though? Um, Some antenatal classes, particularly on breastfeeding? No, I was actually going to start antenatal classes, um, but 
I so it was too late. It then. was a bit late. It was it was like my do you, my do you you know, feel baby shower. I missed that baby was born by the time the baby shower was booked in. You know. Do you feel it could have been offered earlier, considering the problems yeah, you were probably, having in the pregnancy? Probably. Um, I think though, what happened from twenty weeks, I kind of moved into moved off the normal pregnancy path and moved into some special care. My obstetrician got another obstetrician involved who was you know, more experienced with dealing with problem pregnancies and I kind of was put on this track of the, pre the problem pregnancy. So I was off the normal path, I guess. So I don't really remember being offered any of that. Also, we pretty much decided by the time we saw the problems that I, was, I decided that I was going to have a caesarean anyway. So, you know, I didn't need to go to birth classes, I guess. <laughs> no, but you, um, you, you could have been offered breastfeeding classes a lot earlier. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. 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 I don't even remember that being offered at all, to be honest. Hmm. Anybody else? One last question. No, we've worn you out. Thanks very much, Liz. That was great. Thanks so much.